Warning, the tangents in this video got extra tangential. Feel free to skip ahead. At the risk of sounding immodest, I believe I've invented a new form of modular sequencing. I first experimented with the idea in BCV rack, and after that convinced me it was worthwhile, I then spent several months developing a custom Arduino board to make it happen in hardware. But before we get into the details, let's talk computer science. This is a finite state machine. It's a really useful abstraction that can be used to model all kinds of different things. Each of these circles is a state. The machine is only ever in a single state at a time, and it is never not in a state. By convention, it starts in the node that has another circle around it. That's the start node. Between the states are these edges, or links, each of which represents a possible way that the machine's state can change. In this example, it is possible to go from state A to states B, C, and E, but it isn't possible to go from state A to state D without first going through some other state. Links can be labeled to show under what conditions that state change can happen. For an example, Let's build a state machine that models a player's health in an RPG. They start at full health. If they drop below 50% of their hit points, they move into the injured state. If they then drop below 25%, they are wounded, and below 0% they are dead. Let's say if they're just injured, they can be healed normally and move back to the healthy status when their HP is above 50% again. But if they're wounded, then only bed rest or a potion can get them back to being injured even if their HP has otherwise recovered. And if they're dead, only a raised dead spell can change their state, and that only takes them to a new zombie state from which there is only a link back to dead. This is a trivial example, but it shows how clarifying setting something out as a state machine can be. It changes what could have been a mess of unexpected interactions into something much cleaner and more easily understood. And it's perfect for use in a computer program. Each different state could have its own effects on gameplay, putting blood splashes on the screen, changing how a character heals or attacks, different dialogue options for NPCs, and so on. But that is all kept nicely separate from the state change logic, so you're a lot less likely to introduce weird bugs, say by forgetting to clear the blood splashes flag when healing the character one way instead of the other. Instead, either way you heal them simply triggers a state change update, and then all side effects are based on the current state. For a more serious example, Let's look at regular expressions. If you've done any programming or text processing, you've probably come across these. They're fantastically useful, if rather opaque, as a way to search for text. Or to put it more generally, they let you specify a template and then test if any given string of text matches it or not. Regular expressions are, under the hood, finite state machines. Each character of the string being tested is fed in, one by one, and the state is advanced according to the links of the machine. If at any point there isn't a link from the current state for the next character, the string doesn't match and the regular expression fails. If, once there are no more characters, the state is in a specified end state, the string matches. Here's a simple one that'll match the word train. Now let's allow the A to be optional, and also allow more than one I. Now the first letter can be any devoiced consonant, and let's allow between one and three R's. Now also zero or more ends. That star, by the way, is technically called a Kleene star, after the mathematician Stephen Cole Kleene who invented it way back in the 50s. Then it was part of an abstract investigation into what kind of patterns can be described by what kind of languages. Regular languages are one of the most restrictive, being Chomsky Type 3 to use his terminology. They can express quite a bit, as we saw, but not something as simple as a string of a certain number of A's followed by the same number of B's. That is why you should never try to parse HTML with regular expressions. HTML is a context-free grammar, or Chomsky Type 2. Think of div and closed div tags instead of A's and B's, and you'll see what I mean. That kind of recursive structure defines context-free grammars, and regular expressions just can't capture it. So don't try and parse HTML with regular expressions, or you will mathematically provably leave yourself open to really annoying bugs. Just don't do it. Use a lexer parser, or better yet, use a library. All the state machines we've looked at so far have been determinate. That is, for the same input, they will always give the same output. 
But what if we labeled our links with probabilities instead? That way, when it came time to change state, we would roll a die, and the outcome of that would tell us what state to go to next. That would turn our state machine into something called a Markov chain. First described by Andrei Markov starting in 1906, again, long before any computer applications were possible, they have some really interesting properties. They're particularly well suited to modeling sequences of discrete tokens, such as human language. You may have come across one as a toy AI that can generate nonsense sentences. They're surprisingly easy to put together. Take a sample of text. This will be our corpus, to use the computational linguistics term. The bigger the better, but processing and storage limitations can quickly become an issue. Take each sentence. Convert punctuation and label the beginning and end. Now we just count how often each word is followed by every other word across the entire corpus. The table this creates is called a co-occurrence matrix if you're feeling fancy, and it defines our markup chain. Each word is a node. These have links to every word which was ever seen following it, with a probability based on how often those two words were ever seen together. As you can see, it gets very complicated very quickly. To generate a random new sentence, set the machine state to start. Roll the dice and follow the link, outputting each word as you come to each node. When you hit end, print a period and you're done. The results, well, they're not great by modern neural net standards, but they're pretty fun given how easy it was to put together and Markov chains have real world uses too. They form part of something called a hidden Markov model. This is where you can't directly observe the chain, but you can observe outputs which depend on the chain. This is useful in many different situations, but again, human language is a particularly great application. Take a sentence and then the parts of speech for each word in that sentence. It's very hard to generate the parts of speech given the sentence, even if you have access to a complete dictionary. Lots of words are multiple parts of speech after all. Fish is both a noun and a verb. Well is a noun, an adjective, an adverb, an interjection, and so on. But what if we build a corpus of example sentences and have experts linguists annotate each one with parts of speech? Now we can build a Markov chain like before, but instead of showing which words are likely to follow each other, we show which parts of speech are likely to follow each other. This puts hard numbers onto observations like an article is likely to be followed by a noun, less likely by a gerund, and never by a verb. The corpus tells us more than just that, though. It also gives us a list of every word for every part of speech, and how likely each one is. Fish and gooey duck are both ways that a noun can manifest after all, but they're not equally likely. Putting these two sources of information together, we get our hidden Markov model. We can't directly see the Markov chain hidden inside, but we know a lot about it. Our goal is to reverse engineer what the sequence of states actually was, based on what we know about the network, and on the visible outputs that we saw coming from it. This can be done with something called the Viterbi algorithm, and with it we can create our tool for labeling sentences with parts of speech. The hard part, by many orders of magnitude, is generating the corpus. Luckily that has already been done for us, and there are many corpora available for use. The Viterbi code, by comparison, is actually quite simple. Implementing is a common homework assignment for undergrads, and it can be shockingly accurate. The thing about the original corpus is that we know they aren't perfect. Even experts can't always agree on parts of speech in all situations. Using this kind of approach, we can generate results that match it in accuracy. So it's at least as good as humans. And it could actually be perfect. But because even the most highly trained linguists can't agree amongst themselves, we don't have a way to evaluate how good it is. The results are literally beyond the abilities of our species to evaluate. And that's just... Really cool, I think. Enough digressions. I present to you my new module, Node. It's a fairly humble thing, just 4 HP, built around a custom Arduino board. On the front, you have four input jacks, as well as four output jacks, each with its own potentiometer. Starting to sound familiar? This is a module designed to be a single node in a finite state machine. Get a bunch of them together, and you can make your own modular Markov chain. This can be used as what I'm calling a stochastic sequencer to trigger whatever you want triggered in your system. Just like the sentence generator shown before, it follows a pattern, but not deterministically. 
any pattern that can be described using a regular expression, you can generate with enough node modules. For instance, like a bass drum followed by one or more repetitions of snare, one or more clap, and hi-hat, and then back to the bass drum again. The operation of the node module is dense, but not actually complicated. If it sees a trigger coming in on one of these four inputs, it'll set itself into a triggered state. When triggered, this light will come on, and on the next clock cycle it'll send a trigger out of its main output, triggering a percussion hit or whatever you want, as well as sending a second trigger out of one of its four link jacks. The light is also a button which lets you trigger the node manually. The potentiometer next to each link jack determines how likely it is for that output to be selected out of the four. So in this configuration, each output is equally likely. The pot values are normalized, so any configuration where they all have the same non-zero values also means they're all equally likely to fire. Here the first node is 90% likely, the second is 10%, and the others will never fire. And in this configuration, none of the outputs will fire. This is now a dead-end node. It's up to you how the links are patched in. Self-patching is certainly allowed. You could even have one node that triggers more than one other node at the same time, or trigger nodes from signals from outside the chain entirely. Now, that would mean that more than one node could be in the triggered state at the same time, meaning it is no longer technically a Markov chain, but whatever. It's modular. Go wild. There are two types of node modules, primary and secondary. This is set by means of this jumper on the back. Primary nodes are the start nodes for the chain. They have a special front panel and two extra jacks, clock and reset. These two signals, along with power, are passed through daisy chain connections on the back to all the other node modules. This saves precious power ports and patch cables. I had to patch and clock separately to each node on an earlier revision, and it wasn't pretty. This pass-through also adds a special reset capability. A reset signal will put the primary node into its triggered state, and clear the triggered status of all the other nodes. This allows the Markov chain to be restarted on command, which is a really valuable way to add regularity to complicated chains. For example, make the primary node a kick drum, and then send in a reset signal every 8 beats. No matter what the chain is doing, even if it's stuck in a dead-end node, every 8 beats there will be a kick drum, and the pattern starts all over again. There is a second mode of operation, which is accessed by holding down the trigger button for 1.5 seconds. When entering normal mode, which is what we've been seeing so far, this will blink twice slowly. When entering CV mode, it will blink three times quickly. When in CV mode, one of the link outputs can be used as a CV source instead of a trigger. Its associated potentiometer will let you set that value between 0 and 5 volts. When the node triggers, that value will be put on the link jack and held there for the entirety of the clock cycle. These can be used as a classic sequencer or pitch source if you combine them together in a mixer. However, that value is being generated through pulse width modulation because the Arduino doesn't have any other way to generate arbitrary analog values. This can give weird glitchy results when used with some modules, but it's definitely worth playing with. I've put the project up on GitHub, link in the description. This contains a bomb, but there's also a link down there for the DigiKey bomb that I used. This contains absolutely everything you'll need other than the boards themselves. Both the boards and the bomb are the same for primary and secondary nodes. Just leave out this section when assembling secondary nodes. You'll also want to remove two jacks from the bomb order for every secondary node that you're going to build, because secondary nodes don't need those two jacks, and jacks are annoyingly expensive. You'll also have to set up the Arduino chip on each node, first burning the bootloader over the ICSP port, and then programming them over the FTDI port. The Arduino code, which is used in both primary and secondary nodes, is also in the GitHub project. And of course, these don't even have to be used for a Markov chain sequencer. They're general purpose computers, and actually kind of ridiculously overpowered for what they're being used for here. I'm just not good enough at real electronics to implement it any other way. I try to make the design as generalized as possible, so if you just want to play around with Arduino programming in a module, this could make for a good testbed. And now, finally, the demos.